G'day, g'day, and welcome to Tartarian Truthers with your hosts, Casey and Jojo. Don't you love our early colonial buildings, Casey? So masterfully crafted without a single detail overlooked. But can you believe that so many of them were demolished in the 19th or 20th centuries? It's very hard to believe, Jojo, and actually quite heartbreaking when you think about it, but I think that this episode is a great opportunity to examine some of the buildings in Australia that were once firmly associated with our early colonial past. Let's start with our title image, shall we? So literally all the information that we could find on this photo is Demolishing Norwich Chambers, Bly and Hunter Streets, circa 1922. Why, Jojo, would you (laughs) demolish something like this I look at it no idea. Oh. it is stunning but we did do a little bit more digging and we found this letter which was um, in the archives of the Sydney Council so this is apparently a letter that was received by the, the Council of Sydney by a Mr T Foley uh, and so it says that in 1878 I took possession of the gentleman's baths Woolamaloo Bay So this must have been originally the Woolamaloo Baths. Um, And he had to make them acceptable to the public and the residents comfortable. He did works, steps, entrance, erected a urinal, floored shower room, gardens so overgrown the cow could not be seen therein, scrub, cut and cleared and formed walks, etc. Put in hobs to all fireplaces, which that's interesting, Jojo. Why were there no hobs in the fireplaces? Hmm. Water to kitchen, drains, new locks, sundry, other improvements. I feel I have the right to remove some and under circumstances beg favourable consideration for compensation. Now, isn't that interesting? Hmm. So it sounds like he's taken over this building, but for some reason it had been left to become overgrown and quite run down. So how old was this building? Because this letter is dated between 1887 and 1888 Um, and so it was built with such grandeur and beauty and then left to go to squalor such a short time after if we're to believe you know the the official narrative it's very odd really and it makes me wonder if perhaps this was an old world building that had been inherited by this new owner what do you think Mm, indeed Casey I I think so and now for the Australia building It stood at 43 to 45 Elizabeth Street in Melbourne. And can you believe that at the time of its construction in 1889, it was the world's third tallest building? They say it was visible from anywhere in the city and was the first building to use hydraulic lifts using water pumped at high pressure from the Yarra River. Mm. Yet, sadly, it was demolished in 1980. Very sad. So big. Mm. All right. The next one that we're going to look at today is the Colonial Mutual Life Building, which was located in Collins Street in Melbourne. And so the story behind this building is that apparently the Equitable Company set itself the task of building the grandest building in the Southern Hemisphere. Big goals. So they say that it took five years to complete the building, with the building commencing in 1860. So five years, Jojo, in 1860 Mm. to build this monster of a building. It's got a central arrial, iron cresting, a mansard roof and a central clock tower. But even though it had all of that and was the grandest, they still demolished it in 1960 to make way for something more modern, apparently. Mm, Of course. Mm. The Oriental Bank was a beautiful building constructed in 1856. It was said to be themed after a Greek temple and the story goes that it was the result of a competition held by the bank amongst Melbourne architects to develop a design. The bank went bust in 1884 and the building was demolished shortly afterwards. So what they're saying here is after a big competition and such a grand design, it was knocked down just 28 years later. 
like, the mind boggles, doesn't it? it? It really does. That that actually does not make any sense. I mean, look at the amount of effort that has been put into this building. Mm-hmm. The columns, the detail, the intricacies. Why on earth would you then knock it down? Mm-hmm. Makes no sense at all. Okay, now this one, this one doesn't make any sense either, Jojo. Look at it. The Northumberland Permanent Building and Investment Land and Loan Society building. Quite a mouthful. Um, And there's very little information to be found about this building other than its supposed build date and demolition date. But if you look closely at this building, the detail is nothing short of remarkable, especially when we look in the foreground and the background and see that it's actually surrounded by dirt and rubble. Mm -hmm. And why are some of those doors and windows filled in? I don't know, Jojo, it's just such a mysterious building. I I just want to know more, don't you? I sure do, Casey, I sure do. Now, check out the Colonial Sugar Refinery Building. It was founded, mm -hmm, we like Mm -hmm. that word, don't we? Mm -hmm. It was founded in Sydney in 1855 as the Colonial Sugar Refining Company. And this is the perfect opportunity to look at one of the buildings in Sydney once firmly associated with colonial industry. But once again, instead of saving our history, it too was sadly demolished in 1962. And looking totally mud-flooded, might I add. Mm, Absolutely. Mm. Okay, so this one is the Clarence Mansion and this one had us captivated, didn't it, Jojo? Yeah, sure did. So this photo is captioned, unidentified group in front of Clarence Potts Point, 1858 to 69. So an exact date isn't known and neither can we find an actual date for its construction either. But according to the dictionary of sydney.com, the Clarence residence is said to have been built by Joseph Hyde Potts. And during James Martin's ownership, whom can we assume is in this photo with his family? We're not too sure. But it continues on to talk about its surrounding garden as it was famed as one of the most architecturally elaborate gardens constructed in Australia. The gardens are said to have been developed in 1853 to 68 and the novelist Anthony Trollope described the garden as falling down to the sea as a fairyland. But then the property was acquired by the Royal Australian Navy in 1941 and subsequently destroyed. The Navy base HMAS Cuttable now stands on the site located adjacent to the Garden Island Dockyard. Yet another old world beauty destroyed. Now note the huge Sphinx statues in the background too. I mean, quite an interesting addition, especially in colonial Australia, don't you think? And what about what these unidentified people are wearing, Casey? Colonial Sydney and these women are dressed in exquisite Victorian attire, ruffles and double sleeves and parasols. And the gentleman looks to be wearing a three-piece suit too. Mm. Um, Did you notice the woman at his side? Now, I'm not sure if this is the man of the house and if she is his wife, but she certainly looks to be mixed race to me. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. And she certainly doesn't look to have the same skin tone as the others in the, in the photograph. I mean, this image is absolutely fascinating and frustrating at the same time. Like, who were these people and what's their story? I know, Jojo, this photo tells us so much, yet so little at the same time. It's mm. just, it's, it's a mystery. It really is. Mm-hmm. Okay, now moving on to the Adelaide Steamship Company building now. So this dramatic building with its archway and columns is said to have been built in 1903. The Adelaide Steamship Company was founded in 1875 and for more than a 100 years was Australia's largest passenger and cargo shipping company. A sculpture of a ship's prow, the symbol of the company, topped the building. Um, And then in 1939 to 1940, the company refaced the building and all the exterior detailing was destroyed. And then in 1986, the, the whole 
building was just completely demolished. So, yeah, I don't even know why they bothered refacing it only mm-hmm. to demolish it 40 years later. Yeah, such a shame, isn't it? Mm. So the Federal Hotel and Coffee Palace at 555 Collins Street was apparently constructed in 1888 to coincide with the Centennial Exhibition marking 100 years of Australian colonisation. Known eventually as the Coffee Palace, it was an incredibly ornate building and was originally one of the largest and most opulent hotels in the world. It was a coffee palace in that it paid homage to the temperance movement of the times and served no alcoholic beverages. This beautiful building was demolished in 1973 despite pleas to have it saved as a heritage building. And this is one of my favourite old world buildings, Casey. It certainly just breaks my heart to think that they knocked it down. Mm, I agree, Jojo. It's so sad to see such a beauty destroyed. Mm. Okay, now we've got the Sydney Unitarian Church. So this was not demolished per se, but it does have an interesting story behind its demise. So listen to this quote that we found from the sydneyorgan.com website. By the 1930s, the church members wanted to sell their building and move elsewhere, but they could not obtain a satisfactory price for it. Finally, about 4pm on Friday the 6th of November in 1936, during the worst heatwave in memory, a fire believed to have been ignited by a cigarette dropped from one of the buildings beside the church was thought to have set alight one of the many bird's nests beneath the eaves. A strong southwesterly wind fanned the flames until they were burning along the massive beams under the slate roof. Blazing embers showered down on the cedar pews and as it was impossible for the firemen to enter the church, a long extension ladder was run up almost to the top of the spire and firemen poured streams of water over the roof. Red hot slates and blazing beams crashed down, igniting the altar and the organ. Now, I don't know about you, Jojo, but that sounds like it might have been a bit of an insurance job to me. What do you totally, think? Totally an inside job, in my opinion. <laughs> so odd. But either way, it was a terrible loss because it really was such an elegantly and ornately detailed building. The Tivoli Theatre in Melbourne, another one sadly destroyed by fire. Apparently, it was originally known as the Harry Rickards new opera house named after its original owner. Rickards then sold the theatre in 1912 and it was renamed the Tivoli shortly after. In the 1960s, it was converted to a movie theatre only to be destroyed by fire in 1967. Mm, Another fire. Mm -hmm. Okay, Para's Crystal Cafe and Hotel. This was built in 1886, they say, and it was a splendid multi-storey building in Burke Street, Melbourne. It provided accommodation for over 650 people with a staff of 80. It featured lavishly furnished dining rooms, a saloon, a cafe, club rooms and billiard rooms. Leavitt's Jubilee History of Victoria and Melbourne, published in 1888, described Pares as the leading cafe in the southern hemisphere. Its wealth of mirrors so fantastically arranged, its tessellated floor, glittering tables, refreshing fountains and artistic draperies remind one of the magnificent structures of a similar kind which grace the capitals of Europe and America. But in 1960 it was read its last rites by the infamous Whelan the Wrecker. And in regard to the incredible Lewis and Love Silk House which was right next door, We can't find any information on its construction and we know that its fate was also sadly left in the hands of Whelan the Wrecker. Whelan the Wrecker, huh? Mm. So Whelan the Wrecker became infamous around Melbourne in part because of their slogan. Wherever they were demolishing buildings, they put up a sign that read, Whelan the Wrecker is here. We did find a video, didn't we, Casey, of Whelan the Wrecker. Let's check it out. In the 1960s, Australian cities began to resemble German cities after the Allied bombing. When you're walking around, you look at buildings and think, that's going to go one of these. We do. 
You're always looking out for buildings. Always, all the time, you know, with uh, any building well, in the future, it'll be over. It'll see. come down. Do you feel that uh, wrecking is an enjoyable pursuit? I mean, is there any actual pleasure? Oh, know? it's great. I just love it. You do? I love it. Okay, more like Wheel and the Wanker. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> moving on. So what have we got next, Jojo? So now we're looking at Flinders Street Fish Markets in Melbourne. What an extraordinarily beautiful building for a seemingly everyday purpose. They say the building was constructed in 1890 and for over 50 years was used as a market for fish and other produce. It was demolished prior to the 1956 Olympic Games in the government's quest for modernity. This building is absolutely mind-blowing, isn't it? I mean, the clock tower, the spires, the archways, such extravagance, only to sell fish. Yeah, it's, <laughs> this one's always blown me out, really. So odd. It's so odd. It really is. Okay, this is the Fink Building, also in Melbourne, um, and it was said to have been built in 1888 and was Australia's tallest building for many years, standing at 13 storeys high. Its tower featured a mannerist facade crowned by several eye-catching features on the skyline, including a mansard roof. Ravaged by one of Melbourne's biggest fires in 1897 another fire it was rebuilt several years later though but then it was completely demolished in the 1960s probably by Whelan. Mm -hmm. The Menzies Hotel was built in 1867 apparently to accommodate the Duke of Edinburgh's visit during this time and in 1872 English author Anthony Trollope noted that he had never stayed at a better inn in any part of the world. The three-storey building had a columned arcade and pavilion towers. Two floors and a corner tower were added in 1896. And electric lights, telephones and a lift were also installed. Menzies' guest list included royalty, Mark Twain, Sarah Bernhardt, Alexander Graham Bell and Herbert Hoover. But alas, it was to be demolished in 1969. Mm, so many demolished in the 60s. A tragedy. Look yeah. at that. Oh. And another hotel in Melbourne. This one was situated at 444 Collins Street. This one's the Scots Hotel. Built in 1860 and substantially remodelled from 1913 to 1914, it was originally known as the City Home of Country People, but it too was eventually demolished in 1962. And here we have the New Zealand Loan and Mercantile Agency, which was said to have been built in 1876. It was described as a striking Victorian mannerist building Although exact dates for its demise were hard to come by, it's assumed that it was demolished during the redevelopment push of the 1960s. We went again. One, yeah, maybe. That one just, yeah, it blows me out, that one. Imagine seeing that back in the day. It's mm -hmm. huge. But in the 1800s. The, yeah. But notice the streets are noticeably bare. There's one little guy down in the corner here. Mm -hmm. No one else is around. No. Interesting. All right, this one is Australia's first subscription library building and it was said to have been purpose-built in 1845. Um, in 1869, the collection and the building was bought by the colonial government of the time and became the first free public library of Sydney. Oh. So mm, Australia's first library. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, though, this stunning structure was demolished in 1967. Number 28 Elizabeth Street, Sydney. Even though we don't have any information on this building, we still wanted to include it purely for its incredible beauty. If only we could zoom in a little further to make out the finer details. We can't make out the signage 
or the statue's features, although we can see a set of griffins adorning each of the outer windows, almost as if they are protectors of some sort. Mm, this is absolutely beautiful, this building, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It makes me wonder what it actually was used for. You mm-hmm. know, was it a shop? Was it a residential address? You know, what was it used for? Because it's got so many features. It's got the columns, you know, the griffins, the decorative um urns up on the top of the roof yes, the statue and the is just magnificent isn't yeah it? and even the, there's a porthole above that door on the side there I mean there's so much going oh, yes. on in this building mm-hmm. okay so this one is Shepparton's historic post office now it's hard to come by demolition images but Jojo happened across this one which is why we thought we'd add it to our list so sadly in 1973 a historic piece of Shepparton, which is in Victoria, was lost when its post office, built back in 1883, was demolished. So although the local community fought to keep it, they were unsuccessful and the government unfortunately got its way and knocked it down. Mm. So sad. And apparently this town is still trying to rebuild it. Mm. They, want it they want it back. It's part of yeah. their, uh, their landscape. Mm -hmm. The Viking building in Perth was a 115 feet tall, six-storied building. It had a 58-foot frontage and a depth of 108 feet. Said to have been built in modern Gothic style, it was an imposing presence on Perth skyline and provided excellent panoramic views of the city and surrounding suburbs from the roof. Built in 1912, the building had more than 50 offices, either suites or single occupancy, each with its own strong room or what we call now a day as we would call it a safe. Um, Each floor also had its own modern bathroom facilities. Then there was also underground cabling for electricity and an automatic telephone system, which gave the building a clean, uncluttered visual facade. Yet this did not stop it from getting demolished in 1970. So this from the Perth Museum website, Casey, look at this. They they actually show us the before and after and think that the after is better. Is that what we're seeing here? (laughs) No way. Look at that. It's so brutal and ugly. Oh, so ugly. The Viking building was stunning, Mm -hmm. absolutely stunning. Such a shame. So from looking at all of this, Jojo, I mean, there's no doubt that Australia had some incredible old world structures that have now been lost forever. And these were just a few of our favourites, but there are plenty, plenty more in each and every state and territory of Australia that were destroyed under the guise of modernity or by mysterious fires. Now, You guys listening know us well enough by now to know that we don't believe for a second that these buildings were built when the official historical narrative tells us they were built. And the most exciting discovery by far that gives us perhaps some kind of evidence that this could in fact be true is in this book by Jacques Arago. Jacques Arago joined Louis de Fresnay as an artist on a scientific voyage around the world aboard the corvette Urani. So the ex- expedition returned in 1820 and Arago was the first to publish an account in the form of letters to a friend named Batal in 1822. So that was obviously published in French, but then an English translation followed in 1823. We came across this book when Casey was doing some research last year for her bonus feature on Fort Macquarie, which you may remember. Whilst researching, she discovered this travel article by Luke Slattery in the Australian Financial Review, where he referred to Arago and the Fresenet's initial observation of Sydney back in 1819. On November 18, 1819, an hour before sunset, the French Corvette Urani anchored in Neutral Bay, Sydney, with a crew of 125 men and one woman. The captain, Louis de Frassinet's young wife, Rose, who had stowed away dressed as a cabin boy. Also on board was the ship's artist and diarist, Jacques 
Arago, who declared himself enchanted by his first sight of the upside down new world. As the Urani sliced through the heads and sailed up the harbour, he observed magnificent hotels, majestic mansions, houses of extraordinary taste and elegance. Soon he was writing home with descriptions of fountains ornamented with sculptures worthy of the chisel of our best artists, spacious and airy apartments, rich furniture, horses, carriages, and one horse chases of the greatest elegance, immense storehouses. Wow. Okay. This is, I'm speechless. So this is a mere 31 years after the first fleet arrived to a vast country devoid of any infrastructure whatsoever. And Arago is describing majestic mansions, magnificent hotels, and immense storehouses. And Luke goes on to say in his article that there was probably only one majestic mansion worth noting at that time, totally ignoring everything else that Arago described. As for Arago's majestic mansions, there was probably only one of any to note. Naval Captain John Piper's magnificent Henrietta Villa on 77 square kilometres of prime harbour front land. A single-storied Neo-Palladian pavilion resting on an ornamental lawn cascading down to the rocky shore. Piper's Naval Villa, as it is called in a painting by convict artist Joseph Lisette, boasted a vaulted and domed interior like a Byzantine church. It was decorated with rosewood sofas, chandeliers, bronze lamps and Chinese vases. Once the epicentre of colonial high society, it was demolished in 1850 and survives today in a mere verbal trace as Point Piper. But when we looked up Henrietta Villa ourselves, we discovered that according to the dictionary of sydney.com, that it wasn't in fact built until 1822. So this could not have been one of the mansions that Arago describes during his 1819 Sydney jaunt, because it wasn't even built yet. But that's only if we're to believe the official historical narrative, which we don't, do we, Jojo? Mm -mm, no, we don't. <laughs> okay, so then Luke goes on to mention Fort Macquarie and how Arago described it as built in the ancient style. Now, I also questioned this during my bonus feature on this incredible old world fortress, remembering that some of its walls were up to 12 feet thick. It's said to have been built in 1798 and sadly demolished in 1901. Would you look at it? Can, can you seriously imagine how difficult it would have been to bring that beauty down, Casey? With no. With its 90-foot high Martello Tower and drawbridge too? You know, it's wild. Unbelievable. All right. Now, carrying on with this article by Luke, so further down he mentions that some of the other buildings that were accredited to convict architect Francis Greenway, um, which he lists here, as, you know, there's quite a few. He's got St James Church, the Hyde Park Barretts, but what really piqued our interest was the mention of the neo-Gothic horse stable that now houses the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. So I'm just going to read this underlined section here. The penal colony at the end of the earth was little more than three decades old when the castellated stable was opened. In 1821, putting the old haphazardly built government house at the end of Bridge Street to shame. Okay. So the article continues on like this. The Fresenets, for their part, were confused by the scene that greeted them as they sailed up the harbour. At first, they mistook the horse stables, mass of octagonal towers and battlements, home to 24 mares and a number of stallions for the governor's residence. In her journals of 1819, Rose comments on the strangeness of the buildings. It looks like an old fortress with towers, battlements and so on, she reflects. No one could tell us what the governor had in mind when he built it. Okay, so well, not only was Mrs. Fresenet describing a newly built building looking like an old fortress, but once again, Luke has got the dates wrong. 
but doesn't seem to notice. If we're going to go by the official historical narrative, this building shouldn't have even been completed when Arago and the Frestonese visited in 1819. Not to mention, why in the world would horse stables be built with towers and battlements? Mm, that is the weirdest horse stables I've ever seen. Castle. It really is. For horses. <laughs> mm hmm. And this is it today, still standing and used for the prestigious Sydney Conservatorium of Music. It's come a long way from horse stables, hasn't it, Casey? It sure has. <laughs> Look at it. Beautiful. Big organ up the back there. Mm hmm. Mm. So as you can imagine, guys, after we read this article, we wanted to get our hands on this book, right? But to this day, we still don't have ourselves a complete copy. But there are bits and pieces of it available on the net. And when we came across this page, we just about lost it. Listen to this. The coast that borders the spacious harbour of Port Jackson is a curious spectacle. A novel and vigorous vegetation is there intermixed with small houses. The European architecture of which strikes our eyes and excites our admiration. We see only the advanced posts of a city and are struck with astonishment. We are scarcely arrived and ask how many ages this colony has existed. Okay, this is insane, right? This is in 1819. That's just 31 years after the first fleet's arrival to the apparent terra nullius nobody's land. Australian history is a lie, Jojo. If uh -huh. this isn't evidence that Sydney was nothing like the old Sydney town that we were taught about in school, I don't know what is. Yes, it is it is incredible. Absolutely mind-blowing. When you found this quote out of this book, I just was like, wow, mm. this is the evidence we've been looking for. And as we know from our research into the building blocks of Australia Parts 1 and 2, According to the official historical narrative, Sydney didn't have a population nor the manufacturing capabilities to be able to build basic wooden huts, let alone fortresses with 90-foot towers, horse stables fit for a king, majestic mansions and spacious airy apartments. Therefore, we are putting it to you that these buildings were already here. And there were people already here who had built them and were living in them before the British arrived and took over. Who were they? And how were they overcome? We don't know, but we are sure going to keep digging to try and find out the truth, aren't we? Yes, Jojo, we sure are. Now, to end this week's episode, though, we are going to leave you with some footage taken from the Sydney Town Hall Clock Tower by a Mr. William Francis Robinson back in 1873. So once again, keeping in mind that this is just 85 years after the first fleet arrived with their lack of tools, bricks and food, remember, and with only unskilled convict labour to build this new colony. But by the looks of this, they did an absolutely astronomical job, hey, Jojo? Seriously, Casey, this is insane. This is a very well-established city with detailed infrastructure, roads, bridges, houses, terraces, parklands, as well as buildings with columns and spires. I hope you all enjoyed this episode and hope it blew your minds as much as it did ours. Please drop us a comment below. We would love to hear your thoughts on the demolition of Old World Australia, wouldn't we? We sure would. We love your comments. So we will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. See you next time. Bye. 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 Why is today so hard today? I don't it's know. It's fucking annoying. Isn't it? <laughs> it's hard days. I want it to be easy too. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Can you see? No. Oh, well, yeah. I can see your Mac screen. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. I can see our ugly mugs. All right. <laughs> Effort. <laughs>
F it. Like, I say that again? Yes. <laughs> I was just like completely like, what What am I going to say here? Yeah. Um, moder- modernity. The Fresenets, for their part, were confused by the scene that greeted them as they sailed up the harbour. At first, they mistook the horse stables, mass of octagonal, octagonal, why can I not say octagonal? 